Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the meeting of Catholic. I'm Jake Fowler, and this is the Paleocrat Diaries. We're looking at the Ecumenical Councils, Part 11, 10 prior episodes. If you're jumping in right now, you're going to want to go back. Now, I should be clear, the first three are embedded within videos produced by Jeremiah Bannister, the Paleocrat. And the next seven are yours truly, solo. And there's a playlist now on the channel. It's got my name on it. There's 12 videos total, 10, well now 11, uh, of the councils. And then two that I kind of threw in there. One's a commentary on a document called the Manifesto of the New Traditionalism. And the other is a look at Pope Benedict XVI's address at Regensburg in September of 2006. Nonetheless, here we are discussing Constantinople II. Part 10, we looked at the curious life, uh, which isn't over, by the way, of a certain Pope Vigilius. Murderer-ish, accomplice to murder-ish, usurper to the throne-ish. He's a, a mixed bag. But once his papacy is legitimized in 538, June 20th, 538, his predecessor died and he became no longer anti-pope, but pope. From that point on, it's actually quite a heroic tale. Ish. That's about the best we can say about Virgilius. Okay, music down. Outline check okay so if you were with us last time for part 10 we stopped at the year 552 just one year shy of where i wanted to be in 553 so we'll pick it up right there vigilius is in a battle if you will with the emperor justinian over the three chapters now the three chapters are writings of three particular Syrian theologians, Antiochenes, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ibas of Edessa. All three of them, to one degree or another, were slightly Nestorian, right? Maybe Theodore the most, and the other two less so. And Justinian, as a way to reconcile the Monophysites, He wanted to condemn the three chapters. Remember, this was the scheme of a certain Theodore of Asketus. A lot of Theodores and Theodorets going on. Sorry, can't help it. But this was the theme, scheme rather, of his theological advisor, Theodore Asketus. And Justinian thinks it's a pretty good idea. If I condemn these Nestorian-ish theologians, then maybe I can show the Monophysites that the Council of Chalcedon, over which this battle is being waged, really isn't a heretical council. You see, the Monophysites were, well, intransigent, recalcitrant. They were stubborn. They thought Chalcedon taught heresy. They thought it was Nestorian. They thought Leo's tome and Flavian of Constantinople and the whole bit. They thought, no, you've sold out. Remember, we want to follow St. Cyril. We want to follow Ephesus. We want to follow the watchwords, one incarnate nature of the divine word. And so when Chalcedon came along and was sort of developing the doctrine in such a way that now we say Christ has two natures, and you're telling me this is what came before, but I don't see that before, But on the weight of the Pope and the Council, you're saying this is legitimate. You see, there was a rift. And by the mid-500s, the Emperor Justinian wants to heal the rift. So here we go. He wants to condemn the three chapters. He wants to conciliate the Monophysites. But what he's doing in the process is angering all the Chalcedonians, Vigilius now among them. So he calls a council. It convenes in May 
of 553, May 5th, to be honest. There were eight sessions over roughly four weeks. They, were, they, they kind of come in spurts. You have the first three, then another three, then a small gap, and then the last two. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this was mostly an Eastern Council. Oftentimes, the councils in those days were mostly Eastern Councils. We have no bishops from Spain, Gaul, Dalmatia, which is modern-day Croatia in that area, or Illyricum. Only a few from Italy, those that came to Constantinople with Vigilius, and a few from Africa. Of the African bishops present, it was only the ones whom Justinian could, re could rely on. Hand-chosen, these were the guys who were going to go along with what the emperor wanted. Vigilius, for his part, he refused to attend. He said, yeah, I'm not feeling well. I think I'll stay home. He stated, I'll let you guys know what I decide. Now, Justinian was a pretty able theologian himself, and he exercised considerable influence over the council, both directly and and through his theological advisor, this man, Theodore of Eschidas. The council fathers in the first three sessions, which were held between May 5th and May 11th, were persuaded to condemn the three chapters. In the third of these sessions, on the 11th, the council declares that it is orthodox, and it professes to hold the faith of the four holy councils. That would be Nicaea, Constantinople I, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. So we have a situation where the council fathers are persuaded to condemn the three chapters, and yet they want to uphold the council of Chalcedon. It's sort of interesting. How are they able to do that? The rub, really, I, sh I should be more clear about this in case anyone's picking it up here. The rub is that two of those theologians, Theodoret of Cyrus and Ebas of Edessa, were declared to be personally orthodox at the Council of Chalcedon. And one letter, the letter of Ebas in particular, was declared to be orthodox as well. Nothing wrong with that, say the Council Fathers at Chalcedon. So if we're going to condemn these guys and try to maintain the integrity of the last council, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, at least on the surface, it seems so. The next three sessions, there was a little resistance. Some of the people noted the phenomenon I just explained. The bishop said, well, wait a minute. Okay. If we condemn the three chapters, though, what are we saying about the Council of Chalcedon? Because Theodoret and Ebas were reinstated at Chalcedon. They were sort of rehabilitated, if you will. And another one noted, another bishop noted, that if Ebas's letter was considered to be orthodox back then, the letter certainly hasn't changed. So how could we condemn it now? But a vote was taken, and, surprise, surprise, Justinian's will prevails. The emperor gets what he wants. In the midst of these middle three sessions, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, Vigilius drops a bombshell. Now, he's in Constantinople, remember. He was taken there by force in 545. So, eight years on, in the papal kidnapping by the Roman emperor, and here's Vigilius, and he writes a letter that's become known as the Constitutum, right? the first Constitutum, because there are two. In the first section of it, it's quite a long letter, he details the history of events between his departure from Rome and the present day. He recounts exactly what's gone on and how he's been treated, and how he hasn't been treated, and how he should have been treated. 
The second section of this magnificent letter is a very thorough examination of the three chapters. Theodore of Mopsuestia is first. Recall, this is Nestorius' own mentor. He died in 428 in full communion with the church. Now, Vigilius looks at 71 statements of Theodore. The same 71 that the council fathers had examined in their sessions. And 13 of them were deemed to be heretical, and Vigilius rightly condemns these. However, he refused to condemn Theodore's person. He said, no, he's dead. He's been judged by God. It's not for us to go back and issue condemnations of supposed heretics who have been dead for over a hundred years. Theodorus of Cyrus is next. The Pope refuses to condemn him also and any of his writings. He condemned, rather, some propositions that were found in the writings. So he's picking out line by line. He goes, oh, that doesn't sound quite right. We should condemn that. That might be Nestorian, maybe, if it's taken the wrong way. Okay, but we're not going to condemn the writings as a whole, and we're certainly not going to condemn Theodoret's person, because again, at the last council, which was ecumenical and ratified by Rome, he was declared to be personally orthodox. Last but not least, Ebas of Edessa. It's the same story as with Theodoret. Vigilius refuses to condemn his person, refuses to condemn his writings, and, as a matter of fact, refuses to condemn any portion of Ebas's writings. Chalcedon found him orthodox. Chalcedon found the letter to be orthodox. And Vigilius is going to allow no one to speak or write against it. The Pope gives his judgment, therefore, that the three chapters should not be discussed. The matter is closed. And the Council Fathers, they were aware of the letter. This was on May 14th. And remember, Vigilius, he must have had a group of people, or at least one man on the inside, spreading things around Constantinople. All eyes would have been on him. He wouldn't have been very free to go around distributing copies of the letter, you know, handing out tracts or something like that on the street corner, unlikely. But word gets out. The council fathers, however, they seem undaunted. Two weeks later, May 26th, this is the seventh session, after the Pope's letter is circulated and, and made somewhat public, understandably, Justinian, the emperor, is pretty enraged. However, he doesn't act up. He doesn't get violent. He sort of reaches into his back pocket and grabs his trump card. You see, Justinian brought to the seventh session of Constantinople II, some correspondence that he and old Vigilius had had several years back. These were letters and declarations, one of which was made under oath by the pontiff, that Vigilius had agreed to condemn the three chapters. And Vigilius had agreed not to work against the emperor's purposes. This is in writing. This is sworn as an oath. The one in particular I'm referring to was August 15th of 550, about three years prior. And Justinian says, oh, um, council fathers, were you aware that the good Pope Vigilius had already agreed to go along with my program to condemn these three chapters. And here he is writing to you now saying that the matter is settled and that they're not condemned. Oh, sure. He took out a couple of sections of Theodore of Mopsuestia, a couple of lines of Theodoret of Cyrus, didn't even touch Ebus of Edessa. But look here. Under oath, he says that he's going to condemn these. The council fathers must have thought at this point, well, Vigilius is a perjurer. Under oath, he made these promises 
to the most august, most Christian emperor Justinian. And so, at Justinian's behest, his, his prodding, and surely Theodore of Ascetus as well. Remember, he's still sore about the whole originism thing from Palestine. We'll get to that momentarily. The council fathers remove Vigilius from the diptychs. They no longer commemorate the Pope of Rome in the liturgy in Constantinople. The fathers distinguished between the sede and the sedens, or in other words, the seat and the one sitting in it. They said, you know, we're not separating ourselves from communion with Rome. We're separating ourselves from Vigilius personally because he messed up. Look, he says he wants to condemn the three chapters, and now he says he won't. He's out of bounds. He's clearly got Nestorian tendencies. At a final session, the eighth session of the council, which occurred on June 2nd, the fathers put their declarations into systematic form. They formalized their profession of faith, and they gave uh, definitive shape to their condemnation of the three chapters. They had 14 anathemas drawn up also. And notably, Origen is among them. Origen was a third century theologian who was a magnificent scripture scholar, but had a couple of weird views, um, apokatastasis being the chief among them. That's a fancy Greek word that means the final restoration of all things. So, to put it simply, Origen believed that at the end of time, all will be saved, even the devil and his angels. He believed that hell is not eternal. And he's basing this more or less on a passage or a verse from 1 Corinthians. I believe it's chapter 15, verse 28, that speaks of all things being subject to the Son. Okay, um, God the Father has made all things subject to the Son, and Origen says, well, all things, what do we mean by all? And what does it mean to be subject to God? If you're at enmity with the Son in your will, are you really subject to him in a moral way? And Origen says no. Um, and I believe Gregory of Nyssa also says no. But nonetheless, the final restoration of all things, this apokatastasis, is not entirely orthodox. And so it's condemned. Other heretics are condemned. You know, it's the same old story. It's Arius, it's Apollinaris, it's Eutyches, it's Nestorius, and so on and so on. The council closes. June 2nd, 553. And the decrees are then promulgated throughout the empire. Vigilius initially refuses to ratify it. And most of the Western bishops present did the same. The Italian bishops and even some of the African ones, they were put off by the Council Fathers' willingness to condemn these, uh, these Antiochian theologians particularly Theodoret and Ebus, who were declared by Chalcedon to be perfectly orthodox. Several months pass. Eight months go by. And the pressure mounts. Vigilius is away from home. He's not treated very kindly. He doesn't have the people around him that he wants to have, that he would have had if he were back in Rome. And by February, the Pope is worn down. He's an old man now. In February of 554, he declares that, you know, this whole time, I think I've been misled by my advisors. Sounds like he's passing the buck. Nonetheless, he eventually agrees to accept the conciliar definitions. He issues a second letter, annulling the first and giving his definitive, definitive judgment 
This is the Constitutum II, as opposed to the first one from the previous May. Vigilius declares his acceptance of Constantinople II. Okay, so now the Holy Father has ratified it. So now we can consider it truly an ecumenical council. And he declares that everything they said about the three chapters, he's on board with. So on the one hand, in 550 and before, 548, he says, yeah, we'll condemn the three chapters. And then yeah, the council kind of starts and they're not treating him very well. And Vigilius is like, yeah, I'm not going. Forget you guys. We're not condemning those three chapters, by the way. We'll condemn some propositions here and there, but not the whole thing. That was in 553. And then come early 554, he's like, you know what? I, ch I changed my mind. I'm just going to be honest. I changed my mind. We can condemn these. And what I said before, I annul all that. By the apostolic see, by the power vested in me from Christ himself. I annul all of that. Right? I'm sure he didn't exactly say it like that. But you get the sense that he thought, well, I could just undo it. I did it. I can undo it. So what does that tell us then about the nature of magisterial statements? Well, first of all, was the Constitutum I a magisterial statement? I would have to say it is. Does that mean it's necessarily infallible? Clearly not. If it were infallibly declared that thou shalt not condemn the three chapters in any way, well then, Vigilius would have apostatized. The church would have defected. But that's not what we have here. No one points this out. No one says, oh, here's this Vigilius. He just destroyed the entirety of the Catholic faith because he changed his mind. Now, in the West, the council was not very well received. Most of the bishops in the West repudiated it. They thought Vigilius was a traitor. They thought the Pope was holding out. He issued that first constitutum. He's going to stand strong against Justinian, who is bending over backwards to reconcile with these monophysite heretics. The African bishops were particularly difficult to reconcile with Constantinople too. And some of them had to be deposed, not had to be, but some of them were deposed and exiled by imperial troops. In northern Italy and Dalmatia, that's again where Croatia is now, roughly, headed up by the Bishop of Aquileia, a contingent broke communion with Rome and went into schism. That schism was not healed until the 7th century. Now, due to his opposition back east, Justinian placed a certain deacon, Pelagius, in prison. Pelagius was recalcitrant. He didn't want to accept Constantinople II. He wanted to stand by what the Holy Father Vigilius had planned. However, something changed. Maybe it was that Justinian read Pelagius wrong. Maybe Pelagius came to see the error of his ways because instead of writing against the council while in prison, he spent his time showing how Constantinople II and Chalcedon cohere. He's showing continuity. You might even say a hermeneutic of continuity. Now, naturally, he wouldn't have said that. That term wasn't around back then. But you get the point. When we have these two things that seem to be at odds, and we're told that they're really not at odds. Well, what's our task? The task of theology is to try to reconcile them as best we can. Pelagius spent his time doing just that. How could this be done? Well, a couple of ways. Pelagius says, let's recall the distinction between a person and his writings. We could have someone who's truly faithful and who dies in communion with the church, who in some of his writings makes mistakes, even 
heresies. Remember also that people change. Remember that Ibas and Theodoret, towards the end of their lives, didn't work against the Council of Chalcedon. They accepted it. They even condemned Nestorius. So maybe perhaps early on, they were a little Nestorianizing. Okay. But as their lives drew to a close, they were reconciled, and they died in the bosom of Holy Mother Church. So Pelagius says, you know, maybe declaring certain letters or portions of letters to be heretical, condemning them, and yet upholding the orthodoxy of the person, maybe these things are compatible. Because of this, Justinian recognized the usefulness of Pelagius. After the council, in five, late 554, early 555, something like that, Vigilius is finally allowed to go home. Home, home. Not home, the palace of Placidia in Constantinople. Back home to Italy, to Rome. And so he leaves Constantinople, but he never makes it. He dies in or near Syracuse, which is in Italy, but it's not Rome, in 555. Vigilius, prisoner for over nine years. Again, a sordid early life, heroic-ish later life. Was he a traitor? Was he just lacked a backbone? I'll leave it to you to decide. Whatever the case may be, Vigilius is dead, and Justinian knows exactly the man he wants on the papal throne, and he gets his way. It's Pelagius, who just spent his whole prison sentence reconciling Constantinople and Chalcedon, Constantinople II and, and Chalcedon. So there should be peace in the church then. Pelagius travels to Rome, but he's met with opposition. There's not peace in the church. This reconciliation has not quite been effected between the council that just ended and the one 100 years prior. Pelagius, in order to be accepted by the Roman people, had to swear allegiance to the first four holy councils in a written statement. However, he left off all mention of Constantinople too. This was acceptable to the people of Rome. However, it was not acceptable to the bishops in northern Italy, Dalmatia, particularly the Archbishop of Aquileia. I mentioned this a moment ago. This was the occasion for the schism. They said, why didn't you mention Constantinople too? Shouldn't you have repudiated it? Shouldn't you have condemned it? Okay, we understand what you're doing. You accept the first four councils and you're silent on the fifth one. So what you mean is you accept it. You think it's good. Hmm. Well, we're out of here. We're done with that. So they went into schism. In the early 560s, Justinian is an older man by this point. He's been reigning as Roman emperor since 527. His wife had died years ago, and he's still bent on this project of reconciling the Monophysites and the Catholics. He wants there to be unity in the church, a noble goal, a noble goal indeed, but an unattainable one. Now, Vigilius didn't, or excuse me, Justinian didn't see it that way. He says, you know, Constantinople II condemning the three chapters, that was cool and all, but didn't really have the effect I wanted it to have. So we need a new plan. And our new plan is actually going to be part of our old plan. Remember, Aphthartodocetism. Sorry about the Greek words. I can't help it. That's what it's called. 
Aphthartodocetism. This is the belief by some monophysites that the body of Christ was not naturally passable, meaning it was unable to suffer or change. Therefore, his passion and death were only possible because he willed it, not because he could naturally suffer and die. So what are we saying when we say this? Well, we're saying that Christ's human nature has certain indestructible qualities. You might even say it's not a true human nature. I, for one, I'm very destructible. I could be destroyed in a moment. And if our Lord's body, if his human nature isn't like that, maybe it's not really a human nature. Maybe he's some sort of supernatural, superhuman freak sort of thing. Maybe he just has the one nature after all. Now, the emperor didn't really say that, but the monophysites could choose to read it that way. So this is yet another attempt to reconcile them by giving in, by giving in, by saying, you know, maybe we can say this, maybe this will make them like us. And Justinian, true to form, he did what he always did. He wanted to make theology the law, so he issues an edict. Now, this time around, instead of everybody just signing off on it and saying, yeah, sure, it sounds good. Let's see how this goes. He was met with some resistance from the Eastern bishops, particularly a certain Eutychius, who's now patriarch of Constantinople. Eutychius simply refused to endorse this new heresy. Why is it a heresy, though? If we dig down deep... It's because aphthartodocetism requires just one nature in Christ, not two. A composite, perhaps, but not a hypostatic union of a true human nature and the true divine nature. Because of his stubbornness in upholding the true faith, Eutychius was subsequently deposed. Now, the Patriarch of Antioch and about 200 of his closest bishop friends said the same thing. They said, mm, no, we're not ratifying this new edict. We're not signing on it. We don't agree. Clearly, this is just another attempt to water down the faith in order to reconcile with these heretics who obviously don't want to be reconciled. Now, the Patriarch of Antioch and his 200 allies, they did not suffer the same fate that Eutychius of Constantinople suffered because in 565, Emperor Justinian died. The bishops weren't deposed, and aphthartodocetism never really took off. The emperor was succeeded by his nephew, Justin II, who, I believe, was a Catholic, not a Monophysite. He was married to a woman named Sophia, who herself was the niece of Theodora. And like her aunt, she was a Monophysite. So here we have the nephew of Justinian, Catholic, the niece of Theodora, Monophysite, it's the same thing all over again. And it's the same thing all over again, quite literally. Justin II spent his entire reign attempting to bring the Monophysites back into Catholic unity. And he did this through edicts. He did it through, well, this is the faith of the empire. No, this is the faith of the empire. He revived attempts at this union through imperial statements of doctrine and policy. He resurrected Zeno's Henoticon, the statement from 482, a formula of union. And he recalls from exile certain Monophysite bishops, and he declares amnesty for all those condemned. 
but to no avail. The Monophysite sect was becoming too divided. They couldn't unite amongst themselves in order to encounter and engage with the Catholics. And so there was no reunion. The divisions that had been festering since the middle of the fifth century, the middle of the last half, really, of the 400s, they're splitting and splitting and splitting. They can't get their act together, so they can't negotiate. Now, Justin II, Catholic though he was, and probably a good man, his mental health was not great. And by 576, his wife, the Empress Sophia, recognizes that he is not capable of doing this job. And so she successfully lobbies for him to step down and hand over the running of the empire to a count named Tiberius. Tiberius, for his part, was more sympathetic to the Monophysites than Justin had been. Hard to believe. Justin went to pretty great lengths, though he was a Catholic, or so we think. He again, like his uncle, wanted to reconcile the heretics, the schismatics. But Tiberius didn't last long. He died in 582, and he's succeeded by a man named Maurice. Maurice continued the so-called moderate religious policy of Justinian, Justin II, and Count Tiberius. During his reign, however, Monophysites increasingly came out of hiding, and their numbers grew. It was pretty clear now, in, in 582, 583, 584, it's abundantly clear that there will be no reconciliation. There will be no reunion, because again, the sects are splitting. They're each arguing with the next over the finer points of their erroneous theology. We're going to end here, but I, I have to say a few things about the lack of unity, a departure from the Catholic faith, and the inevitable divisions that arise amidst the groups. It starts as one group, then it's two. Remember, we had the Monophysites as a whole, and then pretty quickly uh, thereafter, we had the Severans and the Julianists, and then we had the Agnoete, and then they just keep splitting and splitting and splitting, and their doctrines keep getting stranger and stranger and stranger. It's because without a principle of unity holding everything together, what am I saying? Without communion with Rome holding the line for doctrinal orthodoxy, were tossed about like a canoe on the ocean. These groups, these sects, they fell into heresy, they fell into schism, and then pretty soon it becomes them. They can't help it, really. I mean, they can, technically, but I think you get my point. They can't not. And for clarity's sake, I mean, just to kind of wrap our minds around this concept, think about what's happened in the Protestant world ever since the so-called Reformation, where you had Catholics and then a, a fairly monolithic group who just wanted to reform the church, or so they said, and then within, what, a generation or two, you've got Rivalries developing, and a couple of centuries later, what do you have? Innumerable denominations. Why? They lack the principle of unity. They lack communion with the Church of Rome. They lack the structure of the body of Christ. Plain and simple. All right. 
I appreciate your patience with me. As always, I feel like I'm very long-winded. I'm looking at the time, though. We're just about 40 minutes. That's pretty good. I don't want to give too much. don't want to give too little. have got to save some, you know? We need to have a part 12. Speaking of, I think I'll take the rest of the week, Holy Week after all, to just sort of be with my family. We're going to go to Mass. We're going to worship God. And we'll celebrate Easter this coming Sunday. And I might take a little time on Easter week. I'm not sure yet. I'll have to talk with the paleocrat, talk with Mr. Flanders, and see what they're thinking. Nonetheless, we will resume soon. So again, stay tuned for part 12. In the meantime, don't forget, do the basics, right? Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, comment. All these things help us, help support our mission. You can patronize the meaning of Catholic. You can patronize the paleocrat, Kennedy, for that matter, and Luis, too. And don't forget, before I forget, don't forget about that wolf pack, right? You can see the link down here on the Glad Trad Super Friends uh, headline photograph, right? I'm in there somewhere. I think I'm in Batman's face. T.me slash the wolf pack chat. It's the only place around where you'll find glad trad revolution in full swing we pray for each other we laugh we share memes and stories and we bounce ideas off of one another and there's questions and answers and just general camaraderie it's great so if you don't have telegram download it you can get it on your phone or on your computer t.me slash the wolfpack chat find us there us meaning jeremiah and i tim kennedy the whole gang Last but not least, please pray for this apostolate. Pray particularly through the intercession of Our Lady of Victory and St. Joseph. All right. Well, I had a pretty good time. I hope you did too. Maybe you learned something. Maybe your ignorance is diminishing. As always, never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori.